friends, welcome to Novelty. My name is Mandy Rose Nichols, my pronouns are they, them. Tonight we're drinking some awesome peach apricot honey brush from the Perennial Tea Room here in Seattle. Um, it's got a really lovely, not quite floral, I mean it's a fruit, obviously, but there's like little subtle teas, like you can smell it as you're drinking it. Kind of has this cool back and forth thing going on. Um, and if you're a peach fan, I recommend it. It's um, It's lovely. Tonight, we are joined by Elliot, already curled up in the lap. Um, if there's a lap, he gets in it. So that's kind of just the way it goes. We're doing a good one tonight, friends. We are reading Thumbelina tonight. Uh, growing up, I really enjoyed um, the animated features of Thumbelina. Um, and it's kind of cool to go back to the source material. So if you're a fan of fairy tales, if you're in your jammies, if you're ready to be read to, I invite you to join us for Thumbelina. Here we go. There once was a woman who wanted very much to have a tiny little child, but she did not know where to find one. So she went to an old witch and she said, I have my heart set upon having a tiny little child. Will you please tell me where I can find one? Why, that's easily done, said the witch. Here's a grain of barley for you, but it isn't the sort of barley that farmers grow in the fields or that chickens get to eat. Put it in a flower pot and you'll see what you shall see. Oh, thank you, the woman said. She gave the witch 12 pennies, that's a bargain, and planted the barley seed as soon as she got home. It quickly grew into a fine, large flower, which looked very much like a tulip, but the petals were folded tight, as though it were still a bud. This is such a pretty flower, said the woman. She kissed its lovely red and yellow petals, and just as she kissed it, the flower gave a loud pop and flew open. It was a tulip right enough, but on the green cushion in the middle of it sat a tiny girl. She was dainty and fair to see, but she was no taller than your thumb. So she was called Thumbelina. A nicely polished walnut shell served as her cradle. Her mattress was made of the blue pearls of violets and a rose petal was pulled up to cover over her. That was how she slept at night. In the daytime, she played on a table where the woman put a plate surrounded by a wreath of flowers. Their stems lay in the water and on which there floated a large tulip petal. Thumbelina used the petal as a boat and a pair of white horsehairs for oars and she could throw row clear, clear across the plate. A charming sight. She could sing too. Her voice was the softest and sweetest that anyone has ever heard. One night she lay in her cradle. A horrible toad hopped in through the window. One of the panes was broken. This big, ugly, slimy toad jumped right down onto the table where Thumbelina was asleep under the red rose petal. Here's a perfect wife for my son, the toad exclaimed. He seized the walnut shell in which Thumbelina lay asleep and hopped off with it with, throughout the window and into the garden. A big, broad stream ran through it with a muddy marsh along its banks, and here the toad lived with her son. Ugh, he was just like his mother, slimy and horrible. <coughs> was all that he could say when he saw the graceful little girl in the walnut shell. Don't speak so loud or you'll wake her up, the old toad told him. Old toad told him. She might get away from us yet, for she's as light as a puff of swans down. We must put her on one of the broad water lilies above the stream. She's so small and light that it might just be like an island to her. She can't run away from us while we're making our best room under the mud ready for you two to live in. Many water lilies with broad green leaves grew under the stream, and it looked as if they were floating on the surface. The leaf which lay the furthest from the bank was the largest of them all. And it was this leaf that the old toad swam with the walnut shell that held Thumbelina. The poor thing woke up early the next morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry bitterly. There was water all around the big green leaf, and there was no way at all for her to reach the shore. The old toad sat in the mud, decorating a room with green rushes and yellow water lilies to have it looking her, its best for her new daughter-in-law. Then she and her ugly son swam out onto the leaf which Thumbelina was standing. They came for her pretty little bed 
which they wanted to carry to the bridal chamber before they took her there. The old toad curtsied deep in the water before her and said, Meet my son. He's supposed to be your husband, and you will share a delightful home in the mud. Brock, 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 was all that her son could say. Then they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. Left all alone on the green leaf, Thumbelina sat down and cried. She did not want to live in a slimy toad's house, and she did not want to have the toad's horrible son for her husband. The little fishies swam into the water beneath her, and they had seen the toad and heard what she had said. So up popped their heads to have a look for the little girl. No sooner had they seen her than they felt very sorry that anyone so pretty should have to go down and live with that hideous toad. No, that should never be. They gathered around the green stem and held the leaf where she was, gnawed it in two with their teeth. Then they went away with the leaf downstream, and away went Thumbelina, far away where the toad could not reach her. Thumbelina sailed past many a palace, and when little birds in the bushes saw her sing, they said, What a darling little girl! The leaf drifted further and further away with her, so it was that Thumbelina became a traveler. A lovely white butterfly kept fluttering around her, and at last alighted on the leaf because he admired Thumbelina. She was a happy little girl again, now that the toad could not catch her. It was all very lovely as she floated along, and where the sun struck the water, it looked like shining gold. Thumbelina undid her sash, tied one, of it, one end of it to the butterfly, and made the other end fast to the leaf. It went much faster now, and Thumbelina went much faster too, for of course she was standing on it. Just then, a big maybug flew by and caught sight of her. Immediately, he fastened his claws around her slender waist and flew up with her into a tree. Away went the green leaf down the stream, and away went the butterfly with it, for he was tied to the leaf and could not get loose. My goodness, how frightened little Thumbelina was when the maybug carried her up into the tree. But she was even more sorry for the nice white butterfly that she had fastened to the leaf, because if he couldn't free himself, he would have to starve to death. But the maybug wasn't one to care about that. He sat her down on the largest green leaf of the tree, fed her honey from the flowers, and told her how pretty she was, considering that she didn't look at least like a maybug. After a while, all the maybugs who lived in the tree came to pay them a call. As they stared at Thumbelina, the lady maybugs threw up their feelers and said, Why, she only has two legs. What a miserable sight. She hasn't any feelers, one cried. She's pinched at the waist. How shameful. She looks like a human being. How ugly she is said all of the female Maybugs. Yet Thumbelina was as pretty as ever. Even the Maybug who had flown away with her knew that. But at last, every one of them kept calling her ugly. He at length came to agree with them and would have nothing to do with her. She could go wherever she chose. They flew down out of the tree with her and left her on a daisy, where she sat and cried because she was so ugly that the Maybugs wouldn't have anything to do with her. Nevertheless, she was the loveliest little girl you could imagine and frail and fine as the petals of a rose. All summer long, poor Thumbelina lived all alone in the woods. She wove herself a hammock of grass and hung it under a big burdock leaf to keep off all the rain. She took honey from the flowers for food and drank the dew which she had found on the leaves every morning. In this way, the summer and fall went by. Doesn't sound like a bad way to spend the summer. The trees and the flowers withered, and the burdock leaf under which she had lived shriveled up, until nothing was left but a dry yellow stalk. She was terribly cold, for her clothes had worn threadbare and she herself was so th slender and frail. Poor Thumbelina, she would freeze to death. Snow began to fall and every time a snowflake struck her, it was as if she had been hit by a whole shovelful. For we are quite tall and she only measured an inch. She wrapped a withered leaf around her, but there was no warmth in it. She shivered with the cold. Near the edge of the woods, where she now arrived, was a large grain field, but the grain had been harvested long ago, on the dry, bare, subtle rock out of the frozen ground. It was just as if she were lost in a vast forest, how she shivered with cold. Then she came to the door of a field mouse, who had a little hole amidst all the stubble. There, this mouse lived warm and cozy, with a whole storeroom of grain 
and a magnificent kitchen and pantry. Thumbelina stood at the door just like a beggar child and pled for a little bit of barley because she hadn't had anything to eat for the past two days. Why, you poor little thing, said the field mouse, who turned out to be a kind-hearted old creature. You must come into my warm room and share my dinner. She took a fancy to Thumbelina, but she said, if you care to, you may stay here with me all winter, but you must keep my room tidy and tell me stories, for I'm very fond of them. Thumbelina did as the kind old field mouse asked, and she had a very good time of it. Soon we shall have a visitor, said the field mouse. Once every week my neighbor comes to see me, and he's even better off than I am. His rooms are large, and he wears such a beautiful black velvet coat. If you could only get him for a husband, you would be well taken care of. But he can't see anything. You must tell him the very best stories you know. Thumbelina did not like this suggestion. She would not even consider the neighbor because he was a mole. He paid them a visit in his black velvet coat. The field mouse talked about how wealthy and wise he was and how in his home there was more, there was 20 times larger more than hers. But for all of his knowledge, he cared nothing at all for the sun and the flowers. He had nothing good to say for them, for he had never laid eyes on them. As Thumbelina had to sing for him, she sang, Maybug, Maybug, fly away home. The monk goes afield. The mole fell in love with her sweet voice, but he didn't say anything about it yet because he was a most discreet fellow. He had just dug a long enough tunnel round the ground from his house to theirs, and the field mouse and Thumbelina were invited to use it whenever they pleased, though he warned them not to be alarmed by the dead bird which laid by the passage. It was a complete bird with feather and beak. It must have died recently when the winter set in and it was buried right in the middle of the tunnel. The mole took in his mouth a torch of decayed wood. In the darkness, it glimmered like fire. Well, yeah, because it was a torch and it was on fire. Why wouldn't it glimmer like fire? When they came to where the dead bird lay, the mole put his broad nose to the ceiling and made a large hole through which the daylight could fall. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow with his lovely wings folded at his side and his head tucked under his feathers. The poor bird must certainly have died of the cold. Thumbelina felt sorry for him. She loved all the little birds who had sung sweetly and twittered to her all through the summer. But the mole gave the body a kick with his short stumps. Now he said, Now he won't be chirping anymore. What a wretched thing it is to be born a bird. Thank goodness none of my children can be a bird who has nothing but this chirp, chirp, chirp and must starve to death when winter comes along. Why, yes, you are so right. You're a sensible man, the field mouse agreed. What good is all this chirp chirping to a bird in the winter time when, when he starves and freezes? But that's considered very grand, I imagine. Thumbelina kept silent, but when the others turned their back on the bird, she bent over, smoothed his feathers, and hid the bir bird's head and kissed his closed eyes. Maybe it was he who sang so sweetly to me in the summertime, she thought to herself. What pleasure he gave me, dear pretty bird. The mole closed up the hole that led in the daylight, and then he took the ladies home. That night, Thumbelina could not sleep a wink, so she got up and wove a large, fine coverlet of hay. She took it to the dead bird and spread it over him so that he would lie warm on the cold earth. She tucked him in with some soft thistle down that she had found in the field of the mouse's room. Goodbye, you pretty little bird friend, she said. Goodbye, and thank you for your sweet songs last summer, when the trees were all green and the sun shone so warmly upon us. She laid her head on his breast and started to feel a soft thump, as if something were beating inside. This was the bird's heart. He was not dead. He was only numb with cold. And now that he had been warmed, he came back to life again. In the fall, all swallows fly off to warm countries, but if one of them starts too late, he gets so cold that he drops down as if he were dead and lies where he fell, and then the snow covers him. Thumbelina was so frightened that she trembled, for the bird was so big, so enormous compared to her own inch of height, 
but she mustered her courage, tucked the cotton wool down closer around the poor bird, brought the mint leaf that covered her own bed, and spread it over the bird's head. The following night, she tiptoed out to him again. He was alive now, but so weak that he could barely open his eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelina, who stood beside him with a piece of, tor a piece of torchwood that was her only lantern. Thank you, pretty little child, the sick swallow said. I have been wonderfully warmed. Soon I shall get strong once more and you will be able to fly again in some warm sunshine. Oh, she said, it's cold outside, it's snowing, it's freezing. You, you just stay warm in your bed and I'll nurse you. Then she brought him some water from the petal of the flower. The swallow drank and told her how he had hurt one of his wings in a thorn bush and for that reason couldn't fly as fast as the other swallows when they flew far, far away to the warmer countries. Finally, he had dropped to the ground. That was all he remembered, and he had no idea how he came to be where she found him. The swallowed stay there all through the winter, and Thumbelina was kind to him and tendered him with loving care. She didn't say anything to this, the field mouse or to the mole, because they did not like the poor unfortunate swallow. As soon as spring came and the sun warmed the earth, the swallow told Thumbelina it was time to say goodbye. She reopened the hole that the mole had made in the ceiling, and the sun shone in splendor around them. The swallow asked Thumbelina to go with him. She could sit on his back as they flew away through the green woods. But Thumbelina knew that they would make that, that would make the old field, ma field mouse feel badly, so she said, No, I cannot go. Fare you well, fare you well, my good and pretty girl, said the swallow as he flew into the sunshine. Tears came into Thumbelina's eyes as she watched him go, for she was so fond of the poor swallow. Chirp, chirp, sang the bird, and flew into the green woods. Thumbelina felt very downcast. She was not permitted to go out into the warm sunshine. Moreover, the grain that was sown in the field above the field's mouse grew so tall that a poor little girl who was only an inch high, it was like a dense forest. You must go and work on your trousseau this summer, the field mouse said for their neighbor, the lulsome mole, was in his black velvet coat, and he had proposed to her. You must have both woolens and linens, both bedding and wardrobe, when you become the mole's wife. Thumbelina had to turn the spindle, and the field mouse hired four spiders to spin and weave for her day and night. The mole came to call every evening. His favorite remark was that the sun, which now baked the earth as hard as a rock, would not be nearly so hot as when summer was over. Yes, as soon as, as it was summer, the past would be terrifying and he would be marrying Thumbelina. But she was not at all happy about it because she didn't like the tedious mole one bit. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, she would steal out the door. When the breezes blew the ears of grain apart, she could catch glimpses of the big blue sky. She could dream about how bright and fair it was out of doors. She wished she could see her dear swallow again, but he did not come back, for doubtless he was far away, flying about in lovely green woods. When fall arrived, Thumbelina's whole trousseau was ready. Your wedding day is four weeks off, the field mouse told her. But Thumbelina cried and declared she would not have the tedious mole for a husband. Fiddlesticks, said the field mouse. Don't you be obstinate or I'll bite you with my white teeth. Why, you're getting a superb husband. The queen herself hasn't had a black velvet coat as fine as his. Both his kitchen and his cellar are well supplied. You ought to thank goodness that you're getting him. Then came the wedding day. The mole had come to take Thumbelina home with him, where she would have to live deep underground and never go out in the warm sunshine again, because he disliked it so. The poor girl felt very sad that she had to say goodbye to the glorious sun and the field mouse, who had at least looked out after her through the doorway. Goodness. Farewell, bright sun, she said, with her arms stretched toward, towards it as she walked a little way from the field mouse's home. The grain had been harvested and only the dry subtle stubble was left in the field. Farewell, farewell, she cried again and she flung her little arms around a red small flower that was still in bloom. If you see my dear swallow, please give him love. 
chirp, 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 chirp. She suddenly heard a twittering over her head. She looked up and there was the swallow just passing by. He was so glad to see Thumbelina though. When she told him how she hated to marry the mole and live deep underground where the sun never shone, she could not hold back her tears. Now that the cold winter is coming, the swallow told her, I shall fly far, far away to the warm countries. Won't you come along with me? You can ride on my back, just tie yourself with a sash and we'll fly away. Far from the ugly mole and his dark hole, far, far away over the mountains to the warm countries where the sun shines so much fairer than here, to where it's always summer and there's always flowers. Please fly away with me, dear little Thumbelina, who saved my life while I lay frozen in the dark hole on the earth. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelina. She sat on his back, put her feet around his outstretched wings, and fastened her sash to one of his strongest feathers. Then the swallow soared into the air, over forests and lakes, high over the great mountains that are always capped with snow. When Thumbelina felt the cold chill in the air, she crept under the bird's warm feathers, with only her little head stuck out to watch all the wonderful sights below. At length, they came to the warm countries. There, the sun shone far more brightly than it ever does here, and the sky seemed twice as high. Along the ditches and hedgerows grew marvelous green and blue grapes. Lemons and oranges hung in the woods. The air smelled sweetly of myrtle and thyme. By the wayside, the loveliest children ran hither and thither, playing with brightly colored butterflies. But the swallows flew on still farther, and it became more and more beautiful. Under magnificent green trees, on the shore of a blue lake, there stood an ancient palace, dazzling white with marble. The lofty pillars were wreathed with vines, and at the top of them, many swallows had made their nests. One belonged to the swallow who carried Thumbelina. This is my home, said the swallow. If you choose one of these glorious flowers in bloom down below, I shall place you in it, and you will have all that your heart desires. That will be lovely, she cried and clapped her tiny hands. A great white marble pillar had fallen to the ground where it lay in three broken pieces. Between the pieces grew the loveliest large white flowers. The swallow flew down and put Thumbelina on one of the large petals. How surprised she was to find in the center of the flower, a little man, as shining and transparent as if he had been made of glass. On his head was the daintiest of little gold crowns. On his shoulders were the brightest of shining wings, and he was not much bigger than Thumbelina. He was the spirit of the flower. In every flower there lived a small man or woman just like him, but he was the king of all of them. Oh, isn't he handsome? Thumbelina said softly to the swallow. The king was somewhat afraid of the swallow, which seemed a very giant form of bird as anyone as small as he. But when he saw Thumbelina, he rejoiced, for she was the prettiest girl he had ever laid eyes on. So he took off his golden crown and put it on her head. He asked if he might know her name, and he asked her to be his wife. She would, he would make her queen over all the flowers. Here indeed was a different sort of husband from the toad son and the mole with the black velvet coat. So she said yes to this charming king. From all the flowers trooped little ladies and gentlemen delightful to behold. Every one of them thought Thumbeli brought Thumbelina a present. But the best gift of all was a pair of wings that belonged to a large silver fly. When these were made fast to her back, she could flit from flower to flower. Everyone rejoiced, and as the swallow perched above them in his nest, he sang high and the best songs for them. He was sad, though for deep down in his heart, he liked Thumbelina so much and he wanted to never part with her. You shall no longer be called Thumbelina, the flower spirit told her. That name is too ugly for anyone as pretty as you are. We shall call you Maya. Goodbye, goodbye, said the swallow. He flew away again from the warm countries, back to faraway Denmark, where he had a little nest over the window of the man who can tell you fairy tales. To him, the bird sang, chirp, 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 chirp. And that's how we heard the whole story. The end. That was Thumbelina, my friends. I hope you enjoyed it. Stayed pretty true to some of the things that I've seen. 
Tonight we were drinking peach apricot uh, honey brush from the perennial tea room. And um, man, Elliot's already passed out. Felic Felicity is really asleep. I hope you had a good night, friends. We'll see you later.